So hello, folks. Thanks for being patient. So first of all, I want to give you a fair warning. Today's talk is about rescuing a legacy code base. But a lot of people think this is purely a technical problem. It's actually very, very heavily a business problem. So many of you might find this to be uh, a less interesting talk than some of the other things you've done. I think it's one of my more important talks. But it's very hard to get it fun for developers, because there's very little code in this. So if you actually want to find one of the other talks which you think is a little bit more interesting, I will not be offended for a second. OK. OK, sorry about that. So <clears throat> we're going to be talking today about rescuing a legacy code base and what's actually involved. This talk isn't really aimed at developers. This talk is also not aimed at managers. It's aimed at the communication gap in between so we can understand how to better bridge that gap. So I work with all around the world. My name is Curtis Poe, better known to most of you as Ovid. I'm the CTO. We do training, consulting, and development in a variety of technologies. Uh, heavily focused on databases and Perl, of course, but also Golang and a number of other things. And it's a lot of fun. So if you ever have any questions, uh, you need some sort of consulting, feel free to stop me and ask questions in the hall. <clears throat> For this particular talk, the question policy. If, there's, is it, if you want to expand upon something that I've talked about, let's go ahead and hold that towards the end. Just remember what you were going to talk about, because that helps me keep the timing of the talk a lot easier. However, if there is something that I've said that you did not understand, that means that I have failed as a speaker. And if you didn't understand it, I guarantee someone else didn't understand it, go ahead and hold up your hand and say, can you please clarify that? And that will make me a better speaker, and it will help the entire audience. The first question, though, is what is a legacy code base? I'm not going to go into too much detail here, because there's a perceptual aspect and a real aspect. And the real aspect is a legacy code base is anything you have running in production. It might be beautiful code, it might not, but that's legacy. But the perceptual thing, that's, that's really the interesting one. You're at a pub with your friends, having a drink, and they talk about what they do, and it sounds really exciting. That sounds like really fun stuff. So what's a code base like? It's kind of legacy, which means every single developer in Earshot thinks, I don't want to work for that company. So legacy is a word that you really want to try and avoid, but it's, it's something which is very difficult to avoid. So the first part of this talk, we're going to talk about uh, some of the communication issues between developers and managers. And my talk was originally called Taming Managers, but that's not really nice to say. And there's a lot more involved, particularly since that's what I am now, so that's Taming Me. That would be awkward. So instead of going into a legacy code base, we're first going to start talking about one of the common problems I have when I get called in for a client. Uh, we have a, your typical large test suite. I work for a lot of large clients. They have large test suites. They have large, uh, they have large, large code bases. And this is what I see all the time. The test suites, they take an hour or more to run. The tests often fail. You get all sorts of outputs spit out from the test, test suite, which is obscuring a lot of the information that you actually want to see. So what happens? Developers don't run those tests because you don't want to sit around for an hour doing nothing, or they only run some of the tests. I think these tests actually impact what I'm working on, so I'm just going to run those. And you're lucky if you have continuous integration to actually run the full suite for you. Or you know, they do run the full test suite, and then they're just sitting around checking Facebook while they're waiting for it to run. Or they're talking to one of the other developers and killing their productivity too. So you've got this thing that developers actually stop writing tests quite often when you have large test suites. And the irony of this is a large test suite can actually lead to poorer quality code. Where is my clicker? Oh my goodness, did I just put it back in here? We're live streaming, so that makes me look really professional, doesn't it? <clears throat> so that's, that's an ironic problem with test suites. Designed to improve the quality of our product can actually negatively impact the quality of our product if we don't handle our tests correctly. So this is what happens all the time. Pro programmers excuse for legitimately slacking off. My tests are running. This doesn't help productivity. This doesn't help anyone. So a developer says, we need to fix this. And what does a developer do? They say, yeah, the test suite is too slow and it's hurting quality. I want to fix this by running most tests in a single process. It's going to take me two to four weeks of not adding new features, but we'll make up for it increased developer productivity and a higher quality application. And the manager hears something a little bit different. Four weeks of not adding new features. And there's a very, very good reason for this. To the developer, this looks like an extremely cogent argument. To the manager, this is the only real data they have. 
And when you said two to four weeks, they actually heard just the four weeks because they know how developer estimates work. Or they mentally tell themselves eight weeks. And nothing else was anything more than subjective opinion. There wasn't anything to quantify. And when you're on the management side, you have to assess risk and reward. So we've got this issue. The gulf between managers and developers. That's a big gulf between them, quite often. If you have a company where they're strongly different sides, strongly different areas that they're working on. So you ask yourself, why don't the managers listen to what I say? Because managers learn to trust other managers. Because the other managers are generally speaking the same language, and developers are speaking a different language. Because managers are often focusing on business needs and future opportunities, and developers are looking at ma uh, looking at some of the technical problems, looking at reducing technical debt, trying to clean the system up, which isn't necessarily aligned with business needs all the time, even though you think it is. <coughs> so the risk profile of each is different. They focus on different risks, and that makes it hard to communicate effectively. So the first question, if we're looking at something big, like refactoring a large code base, is how do we get past this communication gap? So here's how a company, a bigger company in theory, runs. The CEO and others, they're looking at the market, they're figuring out the holes in the market, and they're trying to figure out, okay, what are the holes in the market? What can we strategically attack? This looks like a weakness. We're gonna go in, we're gonna go there. And they've created a goal. And upper management creates a strategy of how they're gonna pursue the goal. Middle management develops tactics on how they're gonna implement that strategy, and the developers actually implement those tactics. And what really happens is most people just use their intuition. So the theory of how this is supposed to work and how it actually works is completely different. So this is what the manager actually heard. Four weeks of not adding new features for something which is incredibly important. So we're going to talk about a business case. I'm going to give you a little bit of the information you need to know about a business case. This is the light version. If you want to, you can hit Google, DuckDuckGo, or whatever your favorite search engine is and look for a business case template. And there's all sorts of useful business case templates you can go out there and find and download and fill in in order to present a useful business case that you can give to your manager to explain, this is why we want to do the thing that we do. So the first thing you need to do is you need to understand the problem you're trying to solve and why you're trying to solve it. And it has to be clearly articulated. It doesn't have to go into deep detail about, well, you know, we need to switch to an async, fra async framework because blah, 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 because your manager doesn't understand that. It's, we need to speed this up, and then you have to quantify the problems that you have. And you have to make it very clear, and you have to explain your obstacles to achieving this goal. You have to explain the preferred solution that you've come up with, and you also have to explain the alternative so that they know that you've thought about this problem carefully. When we're talking about the solution, <coughs> first of all, what are the direct costs? Four weeks of me just working on the test suite, nothing else. What are the opportunity costs? Well, that critical feature that three of our customers said they're going to leave us if we don't implement it, I'm not implementing that. Opportunity cost is what you don't get to work on because you're working on the main thing. And they have to be able to balance that out. You have to understand the, what are the risks, low, medium, or high. If you understand your problem space very well, you can control those risks. If it's a little bit experimental to get around a problem that's medium or high risk. And then what are the rewards, low, medium, or high? These are the sorts of information you need to be able to give them in order so that they can actually quantify things better and make an intelligent decision, which isn't based upon your opinion. So first of all, you need to be e extremely, extremely honest about this. Don't pull any punches. If, if your solution is high risk and you know it, you've got to tell them. You avoid loaded language. You don't want to say, this other solution sucks. You say this other solution has these limitations which we've considered and blah, blah, blah. And the manager will figure out that it sucks. If you've presented your case well, they can figure out what your opinion is. But if you avoid the loaded language, you sound more neutral. And they can figure this out better. And you sound more trustworthy. And <clears throat> what happens is when you're looking at something this big, if you give them a good, solid business case and they turn you down, that's not a bad thing. It means they've considered other priorities. But they'll be impressed with you because you actually put something together that they can understand. If you give them a big, solid business case and they go with your decision, but you weren't entirely honest, you'll never get away with it again. You'll have killed your credibility. So let's look at Catalyst versus Modulicious here. So <coughs> we had a client who was looking at having us build software appliances. A software appliance is effectively a bit of code to do a particular thing which can be installed on commodity hardware or virtual machine 
with the absolute minimum OS just to run that software. This is going to be distributed out to thousands of client sites around the world, which meant a lot of updating was going to be a problem. And the client said, the client said, we want to use Mojalicious because they really liked Mojalicious. They thought it was great. So one of the interesting things, if you dig into, say, both Catalyst and Mojalicious, Catalyst, if you've got a problem in the framework, oh, you are down a rabbit hole of dependencies and a twisty little maze of code digging everywhere trying to figure out what the problem is. Mojalicious, yeah, upgrade it, it's gone. It's often that simple. Mojalicious makes it really simple. The company was really excited about that thought. But we started looking at, because we weren't in a position to actually upgrade the software very frequently, we had no explicit guarantees in the documentation of Catalyst on backwards compatibility, but they've got a very strong proven track record of it. Catalyst is very, very good about that. It might be older code, and <coughs> even though it's a little bit more funky for some people, it was deemed low risk on that scale. Now, we're going to talk about Mojalicious, and I'm just going to go to the Mojalicious documentation itself so you know that I'm not being unfair. Mojalicious features may only be changed in a major release to fix a security issue or after being deprecated for three months. If you have a key feature that you depend on, you've got maybe a three-month timeline if they decide to change their mind. That's, that's kind of concerning. Only the two most stable releases of Perl are supported, which means you install Mojalicious, you know the two most stable releases, they get another release, you now have a one-year countdown where you're not guaranteed to be supported anymore. We will keep the distribution installable. That does not mean runnable. Installable up to a certain legacy of version of Perl that we deem worthy of supporting. I can't put these anonymous people on the internet what they deem worthy of supporting in a business case because that, that doesn't mean anything. It's not useful. And so this was a thread I found. Uh, this was Mojalicious breaking changes in a particular year. May 25th, breaking change. June 3rd, breaking change. June 11th, breaking change. Skipped a bunch more. August 25th, breaking change. September 3rd, breaking change. September 11th, breaking change. Sebastian Rydell, quote, we go from breaking changes once a year to breaking changes every week. So in Mojalicious, you actually don't have explicit guarantees in the documentation aside from the guarantee that you cannot trust it to be stable if you need stability, if that's your highest concern. And there's no commitment to backwards compatibility whatsoever. We deem this medium to high risk and let the client make the decision. The client wanted Mojalicious, they want Catalyst. This is not a criticism of Mojalicious. If anyone thinks this is a criticism of Mojalicious, I seriously apologize. This is a discussion of Mojalicious vis-a-vis -vis one particular problem and the sorts of issues they had to face. <coughs> <coughs> so this is part of how you're building up a test case, or a, a business case. And in this case, we're looking at risk. This is what risk looks like. Every time you add a bit of risk, you're adding to this Jenga pile, and anytime you have to change something down there, everything falls over. So a lot of business cases are about minimizing risk. So let's look at the business case for test suites that we have. This isn't the full business case. So we say easier to run tests and it's easier to find tests. Management doesn't care. They don't give a darn about that because they don't see this on a daily basis. It looks good to us, but they don't care about that. Fewer regressions, they don't care about that, but they do care about the fact that it's lower maintenance costs because that's talking money. Increased productivity, they kind of care about that, but when you say it's lower development costs, again, that's starting to talk in a language that they're going to understand. The negative aspect of fixing the, t the test suite is you don't know how long it's going to take to actually do Anyone who's been in management long enough knows that you do not trust a developer estimate. I'm sorry. And it can often be hard to get started if you don't have a lot of background in doing something like this. So just looking at lower development costs, we're going to start translating this into something that a manager can actually quantify. And you make it clear that we don't know that this is actually the case, but this is a good ballpark figure you need to think about. So this comes from when I was working with the BBC, improving their test suite. It was at an hour and 20 minutes for one of their systems. I got it down to 15 minutes. And that was an extra hour of developer productivity every day. But that is not like hiring an extra developer. It's like having an extra experienced developer on your team who already knows the system. It pays for itself in a month once you sit down and do that math. Now, all of a sudden, you've given something very actionable, much easier to understand and follow. And in fact, if we're going to start talking about the future maintenance costs, 
it pays for itself tremendously very quickly because there's a lot of maintenance issues which go away when you have a good, fast test suite. So <clears throat> this is how you start building up a business case. You get down to the point where you can actually have real numbers, you can make real comparisons of the different alternatives, and this is something that management is going to appreciate when they have to make the decision about whether or not you're going to rewrite or restructure an application. So why does this question come up, though, when we have a legacy code base? It's when your costs start encroaching upon your revenue. That's the most common case. There's another case, if you have management that's really paying attention to the market, and they see a disruptive market change coming along, and they know that you can't respond to it quickly enough, then they might be looking at the rewrite or restructure argument. And what you hope is that they are clueful enough that they are paying attention to this before you hit the tipping point. Because if you hit it at the tipping point, your revenue is going to be impinged, and you're looking at the death march scenario. Much harder to get past. So uh, just to give you an example, I was contacted by a company. Uh, I won't say where or how. Basically, they had a large Perl system that was earning them eight figures a year, but it was getting very hard to maintain because the developers didn't know Perl very well. They also didn't know how to build large systems very well, <coughs> and it was completely unscalable, and they had a mess on their hands. And they contacted me after three years of rewriting it in Java. They had hundreds of clients on the Perl system making them eight figures. They had two on the Java system because the Perl system, despite all of its flaws, had all of the features, and they just couldn't get there. So they wanted to hire someone to just keep the Perl system limping along, and then they offered a junior programmer salary for part-time, and talks broke down very quickly. Ironically, they come, came back to me a year later and said, okay, we still have this problem. It turns out the $100 a day developer we hired wasn't very good, and then he stopped returning our calls. And then it turns out they wanted to pay a junior programmer salary for part-time work. So it, again, didn't go anywhere. That can be what happens if you get in the rewrite or restructure argument and then you make the wrong decision. There's also a third option. If you have an older legacy system, quite often it's not actually meeting marketing needs, your business needs, and that's maybe the case where you start to reimagine your software. You're going to go in a different direction, but I'm not going to cover that particular case because that's too much. So you might wonder, this slide said refactoring, the previous slide said, slide said restructuring. Why did I do that? <coughs> so here's a Robert X. Cringeworthy response <laughs> regarding refactoring, or cleaning up code is a terrible thing, redesigning working code into different working code, also known as refactoring, is terrible. The reason is that once you touch working code, it becomes non-working code. What? And the changes you make once you get it working again will never be known because Mr. Cringely doesn't use source control, I would assume. And it is basically a programmer's ego trip and nothing else, cleaning up code, which generally does not occur in nature, neither does writing code, is a prime example of amateur open source <laughs> software. <laughs> a couple of interesting things about this. One, his follow-up article was an apology. <laughs> and you can't find this on the web. I had to go out to archive.org because he took that down. But this is a common attitude. Many people who aren't heavily involved on the development side don't really understand what is happening with refactoring. So I often say restructuring because it skips that little trigger they have of, oh, refactoring, that's just a waste of time. So restructuring your code, what is that? It's the process of making a series of gradual changes without behavioral changes with the goal of, no, not improving quality. Manager doesn't care about quality. They never do. Goal of lowering maintenance costs. You're talking about money. That's what they're looking for. So here's what they're looking at in a rewrite. They're looking at their pros and cons on the pro side. We're not getting into too much detail. They're thinking, OK, we're going to have cleaner architecture. And it's going to be easier to maintain. Everyone takes that for a given. We're going to be able to hire more developers. So if you switch from Haskell to Java, yes, you're going to be able to find more developers. No problem. Uh, that's when they're deciding to make a language switch as a side to just an <coughs> architecture switch. Sometimes it's making the impossible possible. Um, that's a frustrating one because if it's making the impossible possible, I know there's some ray tracing software written in Perl. Do you think that's going to scale? Yeah, you're, you're not rewriting that into something better. You're, repla you're not refactoring that, you're replacing that. The cons with the rewrite is you still have your old code base. And now you've got a new code base, so you have to pay for two projects. It becomes extremely high risk. You can lose a lot of business knowledge. So 
you've got this thing that uh, if you don't assign this particular code to a particular account, you don't get the R&D tax break at the end of the year, and you forget to put that in the new one because it's just one line of code buried deep within your code base, and now you've lost a lot of money and you didn't see it. You can lose a lot of technical knowledge. You're working on a system which is reading SNMP information. You discover a lot of routers don't implement that the same way. They have a different idea of what that means. It's easy to lose that sort of technical knowledge. And it's also a huge scope of work. Because you can't just say, we're going to rewrite this. What does rewrite mean? We're going to copy everything from the old system to the new system. Well, the old system sucks. So we're going to do the rewrite. And we're going to figure out what we are and are not going to keep. And there's a lot of work up front to figure out what you're going to do. It's hard. But the reality is, you wind up in a situation quite often, I've seen this with too many companies on rewrites, that they wind up in time pressure because the rewrite is taking so long because often the new team doesn't have the business knowledge of the old team, they have to communicate back and forth, it's disrupting everything, and they're getting pushed faster and faster to get the rewrite into production. So they start taking shortcuts, and the cleaner architecture and the easier to maintain goes away. You wind up with one plate of spaghetti, you've exchanged it for a different plate of spaghetti. Being able to hire more developers, that's often true. Making the impossible possible, that's one sometimes you can't get around. So some of your major pros in a rewrite don't actually exist. If you're restructuring, you're keeping the same app the entire time. Your business knowledge is kept. Your technical knowledge is kept. You're only maintaining one system. You've got a smaller scope of work. The smaller scope of work is really interesting because you don't have to restructure the entire system. You can say, this is our main goal because our problem is, our system is about twice as slow as it needs to be. So all we need to do is focus right now on making it twice as fast. So you can keep a smaller scope of work if you're going to do a restructure. You might have technology lock-in. I know of a company that wrote a million dollar a month free-to-play game. They were making a ton of money. But to save development costs, they decided not just to use Flash on the front end, but also use Flash server. So everyone's saying, why don't you just rewrite it in HTML5? Because HTML5 doesn't talk to a Flash server. And now they have a game which is earning a million euros a month that they're going to throw away because they've realized that the cost of re-implementing the entire thing is too much money because of technology lock-in. Again, you can have the impossible need. Sometimes your current system cannot be transformed into what you want for the new system. And getting buy-in is tough. And why is getting buy-in tough? So what we have is buy-in is difficult because many people are really attracted to the idea of a new, clean, fresh, shiny system. So you're coming back to your business case here. You've got your business needs, you've got your technical needs, and you're building a business case in between the two of them. So let's talk about the rewrite solution. So would you actually pitch this? Basically, for one study done in 1995 of large product, large IT projects, which a rewrite generally is, 30% were impaled or fared or failed. And in a follow-up to that study of over 3,000 companies of large projects, only 6.4% of IT projects were successful. So you go to your boss and you say, OK, uh, we think this is going to cost between 2 to 3 million euro to rewrite the system. And you have a 30% chance of flushing that money down the toilet. If you're lucky, they're going to laugh at you. If you're unlucky, you're going to be collecting your things and get escorted out of the building. So no one ever pitches it this way, even though this is the reality of what they actually face, because everyone is overconfident in their ability to deliver on a rewrite. So why do they fail? First one, we spend too much money to stop now. The sunk cost fallacy. It is hard to break out of that, though. We are so close. And that last 10% takes just as much time as the first 90%, if you're lucky. And nobody wants to admit that they're wrong. The janitor doesn't make the decision to do the rewrite. It's people higher up in the company who make the decision to do a rewrite. And if they just admit that they've wasted millions and millions of euros of the company, that's bad for them. So they don't want to admit it. They don't stop. There's all sorts of capacity planning problems with this, which become a nightmare because you can't allocate everyone effectively when you're trying to maintain two projects. <clears throat> and quite often, the goals for this new project can be extremely unclear. Because, OK, we're just going to rewrite the thing. We're going to port it over bit by bit. But not everything translates well. But we won't cover that right now. Instead, why do the devs often object to refactoring? Here's a dirty little secret. They don't know how. But they don't want to say this. It's too big. It's too complicated to restructure this application. It's going to take us too much time because 
they don't think about the business side. They don't think about narrowing, narrowing the scope of what they want to do. And it's such a big project that it can be overwhelming if you're not familiar with it. So they, they don't know how. So they're, oh, rewrite's a much better solution because they know how to write code, but rewriting code could be difficult. So now I'm going to start getting more, a little bit more to the technical side where I'm going to tell you how to rewrite this code to, make it, to restructure the code. So the first thing you do is you've got to figure out what your actual problem is. This is a problem which led you to the point of saying, are we going to rewrite or are we going to restructure our application? The problem isn't we need to throw this code and rewrite it. Uh, the problem is, you know, is the system too buggy? Is it too slow, too unmaintainable, something else? But those are actually useless problem statements. Our system is too slow because. This is a problem because. And when you ask these when you say these things, like it's too unmaintainable, just imagine someone's coming up to you and they're saying why three to five times. Well, why is it too unmaintainable? Because. Well, why is that the case? Because. And they keep asking these questions. Imagine like, you know, it's your little seven-year-old daughter asking you, why, daddy? Why, daddy? Over and over again. And you've got to keep answering that. It's hard to do. So go through that mental exercise because when you can get through that to explain the problem, you can better understand what you're actually going to try and fix. And then we go through, pardon the uh, management speak here, what we call an OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, and act. And this actually means gathering information, processing the information, taking a decision, and implementing that decision. Now, gathering the information, that's some of the stuff that I covered already, where you're trying to figure out what the problem is, where you're reading through the documentation, you're trying to put together a plan of understanding what your actual problem is, and then you come to the orient process where you're processing that information, and that's where things often fall to pieces, because if you didn't gather enough information that a manager can use to assess the risks, to assess the rewards, to assess the costs, then they fall back on intuition. And here's a little trick. Every trial lawyer in the world will tell you, if the jury doesn't understand your case, they will vote to acquit. If the manager doesn't understand your case because you didn't present the information well, they will say no. So that's where things often break down. Once you've gotten to the point where you've gathered the information, you've processed the information, then you can decide which way you're going to go. And then you can start to figure out how you're going to get there. So gathering information, th this is fairly straightforward. There's nothing fancy about this. You know, you figure out what are your functional requirements, you know, what's the architecture. Documentation, you often want to pull in your documentation to figure out what's going on, but there's a huge danger. If you have a legacy code base, you have legacy documentation. Documentation is often wrong the very first time that it's written, and it doesn't get better with age. So the documentation might give you a sense of what was there, and then it also depends upon who wrote the documentation. If it was a business aware developer who said this system is designed to solve this problem for the customer by applying this reasoning, maybe it's okay. If it is this system divides this number by that number and multiplies, it, which you see sometimes, then it's not okay. If the documentation is a description of the code, it's not good. If it's a description of the business problem, you're in luck. What tests exist, if any, most of the time for large systems like this, I find that you have very poor quality test suites, so that's certainly a problem, but the tests can help you as you're restructuring the application to keep things in place. What areas of the code are more fragile? That's where you start hitting your bug systems, your bug trackers, and your issue trackers. <coughs> in case anyone's wondering, a bug tracker is this feature is not working correctly, and an issue tracker is all the people reporting the fact that that issue is not working correctly. So you might have six or seven issues opened up against the bug tracker, and the issues are tracking how your business people are resolving that problem with the customers. And the bug tracker is what the developer usually cares about. And then, you know, what areas of the code's more fragile? Your developers can often tell you, yeah, if we touch this part of the system, it's always breaking. So that's a good candidate for something to touch. What external resources does it require? That's a hard one. <coughs> because external resources you often have no control over, but you need to understand those. And then when you're processing the information, First thing, root causes. Always get down to the root causes of problems. If you don't do that, then you're really not giving them the information they need to actually figure out how they're going to proceed. So then, when you're processing, processing the information, first you're relying on facts. If the facts don't give you a clear guideline, but the facts are sufficient enough that you feel very comfortable in them, then you can go with opinion. You can use your experts ins inside to say, well, I think we should go left instead of going right. And then if they don't have a strong opinion, they might say, well, it looks more fun to go left instead of right. So then you first facts, then opinions, then emotions. 
but always focus on your root causes. <clears throat> Taking the decision, the D in the OODA loop, you define your success. 50% test coverage is rubbish. That is not your success criteria. Why? Because if I delete your test suite, your code still runs, and the management doesn't care about your test coverage. They really don't. 50% monthly reduction in support calls. That's a really good goal because it's very clear, very easy to understand. But you also have to be careful with that. Because once you give a number, people can game it. 50% reduction in support calls, you can attain that if you get a 50% reduction in customers. I know one company where the call center manager won an award for a magnificent reduction in support calls and was therefore saving a lot of money in the support department. And then they found out it's because he instructed the developers to hide the phone number deep within their website so people couldn't figure out how to call them. So be careful. You put a number up there, people will figure out a way to game it. And that's where <laughs> Clueful managers and developers need to be able to step in to pay attention to that. But at this point, you've got a good success, success goal, which actually meets business needs. You can decide your approach, and then you can set a time frame. If you don't set a time frame, things will continue indefinitely. If you don't hit your goal by the end of the time frame, that's OK. You can reevaluate at that point. But at least you've got a clear point that you can actually take a decision on, and it can be useful for. And then the act portion. Shut the heck up and write some code. I know this is what most of us probably find interesting. So how do you actually go about this? So I recommend, first of all, getting a designated technical expert. And often someone who is not part of the <coughs> team. Because one of the things you see quite often, developers come into a team for the first time. And the first few months, they're really excited. They've got all these ideas about things to improve. And after that initial period, they're just used to it. They're the frog in the, in the hot water. They don't see it anymore. And if you have people on the inside, they might be sufficiently able to see past that. But having someone from the outside can often help you say, actually, that looks like a problem. Why are we doing it this way? And it won't be, well, we've always done it that way. Because that's not a great answer. Your technical expert, they need to understand the business needs. They need to have an understanding about architecture. They might need to know about databases if you're heavily database driven. All sorts of things, which I'm not going to go into right now. But a key thing is you want to have someone who is able to admit when they're wrong. If you don't get someone here, then again, the entire process breaks down. Because you go down a, you go down a dead end, they won't admit it. They're the managers who don't want to admit that they were wrong about spending $3 million on the rewrite. They're the managers who say, we spent too much money to stop now. So that's hard to find, but it's important. And then you're going to get an architecture roadmap. This is an ideal thing. This is not what you're going to implement. The reason for that is we want to get from A to B, but we know we can't get to B. But if we're going to build this interim thing, we need to know it's at least going in the right direction. So this is a rough over idea of this is what we think is achievable. This is what we think is good. And we know we're probably not going to get there for our initial work. But at least we know the direction we're going to head. And then the refactoring is how do we get closer to this ideal? And then how do you start? There's almost always something in your system which must not change. So for one of our clients, they have this really hideous web interface, which you have these gray tables on a lime green background, very small print, and obscure icons you can't figure out. It is a mess. And they've tried to fix it several times, and their support department screams bloody murder. So that's what they can't change. Well, great. Now they know what they can write tests against. Because if that's what can't change, you know exactly where you can have your initial target of tests, and you can go back and looking at changing that later. And you pick a small initial target, because when you first start out on this process of restructuring your test suite, you want to limit the scope as much as possible and create something which is sometimes called a tracer bullet or similar things. So imagine this code. You see this oftentimes in like old CGI type style websites. Uh, you've got your invocant customer ID, product ID. You know, you've got your SQL embedded in here. You're printing HTML by hand or inside your, you know, with here documents. It's an absolute mess. And in your ideal architecture, some of the implementation might look very clean like this. You select products from a model. You fetch it with your product ID or you re redirect a status not found. You stash the product and it goes off to your view. That would be lovely. That's not going to happen. But that's where you want to go. Assuming that, say, we're working with a web MVC framework, which you may not be. 
So your initial target, are you going to pick your SQL, your HTML, or your logic? In this case, I'm just imagining a website. It doesn't have to be, obviously. Uh, is it going to be something customer facing or back end uh, or smallest task or risk? <clears throat> That's really going to depend upon what your needs are, what you feel most comfortable with, which areas you feel that you have the skills in order to do for the first bit. So for one company, um, the smallest task or risk is what I actually picked because in, inside their URL, they had an action attribute, which was the name of the method that they called. Yeah, guess what? It was dollar self, dollar action, and obviously that's a huge whopping security issue. So the very first thing I did in rebuilding their system was to take out these big security risks and creating dispatch tables. If you weren't in the dispatch table, you got a 404, and we logged it. So we got rid of that security hole. It's a very simple initial way of verifying that you haven't changed the desired behavior. And then you're writing integration tests. A lot of people say, oh, unit testing, unit testing, unit testing. Big applications are often very, very hard to unit test because when you've got that 3,000 line method, you're not writing unit tests against it. So in this case, we're writing integration tests against a view. You might have, uh, say, a mechanize object, which goes out, hits the view. These are very expensive tests. It's very frustrating, um, <clears throat> but you've got to start somewhere. And if people are asking about TDD, forget it. TDD is a wonderful, lovely idea. Virtually every study out there about TDD is horribly flawed. It is not proven to actually give people the benefits they want, but it makes them feel comfortable. Use data. We'll I should cover that in another talk, actually. So tests. Tests are about restructuring, and they should not change behavior. If you see the behaviors change, then that causes a lot of issues, but I won't go into that right now. It's not about changing behavior because you do not change behavior at the same time that you're restructuring your application. And tests can help you avoid changing behavior, but they can't prevent it. And you probably need to rethink your testing strategy. And the reason for that is Perl developers are often taught how to test modules. You're not testing a module here, you're testing an application. Your test suite should not be a bunch of silly little .t scripts scattered all over the place with embedded SQL and embedded HTML because that's exactly what you, what you won't allow in your application. Why would you allow it in your test suite? So use a test framework. <clears throat> uh, XUnit style frameworks. Um, obviously, I wrote test class Moose initially, so that's one that I'm really fond of. Test class is another one, a little bit lighter weight, doesn't do quite as much. Test database changes should be transparent. When a developer is working on writing these tests, they shouldn't have to worry about, you know, do I start a transaction? Do I have to figure out how to clean up after me? If they have to do any cleanup, that's a code smell in your test suite. That should all go away. High level integration tests are high value. If, you're, if your very first test is log in as this customer, go to their, you know, sales by region report and filter out the top 10 sales, and that's all your test is to make sure that, that resulting table is correct. You've tested authorization, you've tested authentication, you've tested dispatching. There's so many things. There's a lot of huge amount of code you've actually exercised, and though you haven't tested it, this has a nice side effect that quite often when you're rebuilding your code, even though you haven't tested the code, you've run the code, and it will break things like this. So thank you. So very high value. <coughs> so fixtures, I generally recommend to put them in roles inside of these frameworks to make them very easy to load, make them lazily loaded. And tests need to be discoverable. Inside of my editor, I'm in, a test, I'm in a class. I hit comma GG, boom, I'm in my test class. So I never have to worry about that age-old problem of where are my tests? I hear this so many times with large test suites. And correctness first, then performance. First make it right, then make it fast. I hear the Ruby community talk all the time, ha oh, look how fast my tests are. Yeah, but are they correct? This is a big problem we have. So a correctness example, your database. Use the same database you have in production. If you're using a MySQL database in production, do not test your code with SQLite. Do not do this. I've seen this so many times because they are not the same thing. If you have an integer field in SQLite and you insert the string foo, it's happy. Or you're using DBX class with date time inflator. MySQL quite often will inflate that into the floating time zone. SQLite will, float that, will inflate that to UTC. So your code stacks are behaving completely differently in so many different ways that you don't expect. And they're like, oh, it's faster. I don't care if it's faster, make it correct. Make sure you're using the same version of the database, and you can't always use the same configuration, but keep them as close as possible. So if you're using MySQL and you're not using strict in production, you do not start out using strict on your test database. 
because your code will make your code will eventually be designed to assume that you don't have a strict database and a strict database in your test suite will cause it to fail. You want to get there eventually, obviously. <coughs> so test framework. This is an example. Large applications, you're not going to build a huge website without using something like Catalyst or Modulicious or Dancer or whatever like that. Um, test suite should be the same. Use a framework. I recommend Test Class Moose because I just know it really well at this point. So here's what my base class might look like. So package, test for my project, use test class moose, and in the test startup, this runs before every test class, we start a transaction. Test setup, we start a save point, test stare down, we roll back the save point, test shut down, we roll back the transaction. A developer never has to clean up their, their database. And they don't have to worry about you know, something else stepping on this because it all runs in a transaction. Uh, there's a lot of other work, obviously, it's a very simplified version. This is uh, a simplified version of some actual tests we have for some of our code. So we have this period method we export with test fixture character. This allows us to lazily load character fixtures, so they're not loaded unless you ask for them. So we ask for character Winston. We verify that Winston's not VIP. Then test now minus period because we tend to use immutable date times whenever we can. We set our VIP until yesterday. We verify it. They're still not VIP. Notice what I've not done. I've not said, OK, use these testing modules, because it imports a lot of that for me. I haven't had to set up a transaction. I don't have to clean anything up. In fact, if I don't have a test class for my class when I hit comma GG, boom, I get that written out for me. So I am immediately diving into huge, complicated tests without having to do a lot of setup. It really makes your te testing life easier. So that's, uh, we have a custom test harness that I often use. This is what a lot of our test output looks like. And you'll notice I try to name my test. So test we can't purchase clone that is not available. So you have nice, easy to understand test names. And at this point, you're going to hit a phase transition. So if you're familiar with chemistry, you know that, let's say, pure water ice. For pure water ice, you increase the temperature. And the temperature goes up and up and up. And then it starts hitting zero degrees. And then it's going to convert to water. The temperature stops going up so much because it's doing a lot of stuff changing the molecular structure inside. And then the temperature will shoot up again. Here you're in a phase transition where you're, it's kind of like that period where you're not seeing the temperature rise because you're fundamentally changing what's going on. So you need to be aware that when you first start this, your development speed is going to slow down dramatically because you're transitioning into a different phase where you can get things done better. You have to be expecting this. And then iterating. First transition, did it succeed? What are the next, ste next steps towards our goal? Everyone knows the goal. You keep your eye on that. You plan your next steps. You execute them. You go to step one. It's very simple at this point. You pick out the next bit. So I talked about that security bug that I squashed. That was my very first thing. I got a test framework up and running. And now I was moved on. I think I moved on to the SQL next, moving that out into a model layer. And you can just do that a little bit by a little bit by a little bit. Remember, restructure, separate your restructuring code and changing behavior. That's very important. Don't try and do t both at the same time. Now, always keep in mind your time frame and remembering your su success criteria. Five minutes. Thank you, Max. The last little bit I'm going to talk about here is prioritization. Now that you've got this started, you've got a big project. What do we do next? And you know, if you're a manager, devs are always coming, to, or a product owner, devs are coming to you. What are we going to work on next? You know, depending upon whether or not you use Scrum or something else, you might have a way of handling this. What we do, you've already got buy-in, so you build many test cases for the next set of tickets that you're going to have. And so this is uh, from a real sheet we have. We build a three-number business case: complexity, monetization, and usability. So those right there. And what are they? Complexity is how difficult is it to build this feature? Uh, for Tau Station, it's a free-to-play game, so how likely is it to increase the fact that people are going to pay us money, and what's the utility to the player? We assign weights to those various values. We figure out the pros, the cons. We've got a scale that makes the number look a little bit nicer. We add those together. We get a score. And then I get all the tickets up there. I assign all those numbers. I sort it. Anything with the highest score, that's what you work on first. Management loves this. They love this because it's very easy to figure out why you're working on something. So when you build the numbers, you want to automate spreadsheet creation. So I've got a script which goes out there. It grabs the last milestone spreadsheet, pulls the data off that. It goes out to GitHub, grabs a bunch of data from there, goes out to ZenHub, and grabs a little bit of information there. It adds it all together, and it builds a spreadsheet. I sometimes fill in a few numbers for new tickets which aren't there. 
I sort it, I post it online, share it with our developers, and they don't have to come to me usually and say, what do I work on next? I point to the spreadsheet, what's the next item down? Really saves a lot of time, really improves communication. Uh, product owners choose monetization and utility in this case. The developers are going to choose the complexity. Don't tell the developers how complex their work is. They know better than you do. Other factors may override. Is security you know, a key usability issue for you? Sometimes management doesn't understand security, so we're going to improve the security of the passwords, but the customers will never see that, so the manager might say that's not important. So sometimes you break security out, you f choose other factors that you want to add up for the score, but it makes it much, much easier to figure out what your process, figure out what your next steps are and why you're taking those steps. So you always focus on your measurable goal, and you can stop at any time. That's the great thing. If you're rebuilding the site, if you're rewriting everything, people don't want to stop because, oh my god, look at all this money we spent, we can't stop now. If you're just refactoring, you can stop. It's not a problem. You're not worried about wasting the money because you still built stuff and you still have working code, which you don't necessarily have to rewrite. That is why not throwing away your code, spending the time rewriting it is often so much better. And that covers that. I know it's been a rather dry talk, a little bit different from what you're used to, but does anyone have any questions at this point? Yes? Okay. Um, you might want to ask me about that later because I can talk to you a little bit more in depth. But basically, the question is, you know, can you expand a little bit more about your comments on test-driven development? Is that accurate? So basically, there was a wonderful series of articles by a Ruby developer who's a huge test-driven development proponent who decided to go out there and look at all these studies promoting test-driven development and really break them down. And he found that every single study had serious flaws. So I was reading one study put out by Microsoft. Test-driven development improves the quality of our code. First of all, they didn't define quality. Second, they didn't define test-driven development. <laughs> Third, when they said test-driven development compared to non-test-driven development, they didn't define non-test-driven development. Then they referred to information from another, from an IBM study, where they didn't qualify what that information meant. And I see this in test-driven development studies all over the place. And when I read through these studies again and again and again, they make all sorts of grandiose claims, thank you, which they don't actually back up because they don't define their terms well. The same thing you have with the business case. You have to define your terms very well. They have to be quantifiable. And these studies are, because they don't define their terms, or they define them very, very loosely, it's very hard to actually back up the claims that they make. And I've been doing this for a long time. I tried doing test development, driven development for a while, and sometimes I do when I'm exploring trying to how to build an API, because I don't know the best way of building it. But um, ask me about it later. And I'll see if I can find the article where the guy said every test room development study he found doesn't actually back up his thesis that test room development is better. And then he finished with, but you should use it anyway. <laughs> so, similar question over here. One yes. One of your slides said that the large test suites tend towards lower quality code bases. What's the attribution? Okay. So large, when I said this is my personal experience with large test suites, I should qualify that. when. They're really slow to run, and the developers aren't paying attention to the quality of it. That's when it's really slow to run, and you have tests. Oh, yeah, I'm used to that test failing, so they start ignoring that test, which means this other test starts failing. Well, they're used to test failing. They ignore that. I was at the BBC at one point, and I was fixing all their failing tests, but I noticed some tests, I moved on to the warnings. Oh, this test spits out warnings all the time. We don't care. I tried to fix the warning, and it turned out it was actually a critical bug with a variable, which never should have been undefined. They got used to ignoring that. So it's, so it's more about tests <coughs> tweets with failures in them that happen all the time. Yes, poor quality, poorly maintained test suites where you don't have the time to fix it, to make it run cleanly, to make it run fast, which is a better way of saying it leads to poor quality code. Um, that's a use case. That's a system I've seen many times. But it is not, I'm not saying this is always the case. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. If anyone has any other questions, please feel free to stop me in the hallway, ask, uh, and I'll have more time to clarify stuff there, or just hurl abuse at me. That's fine. I, I can take it. Get the MS9 piece. 
Uh, the slides are online. Uh, Uh, if you go out to slideshare.net, you search for Ovid, you'll find it. It's a slightly older version of the slides, but it's pretty much the same thing. 